Now we have more uh, co-presenters in the next one. Um, we have Jessica Davis, Karen Huang, Eva Kaplan, Christina Patuelli, and Matt Miller. Um, the title of the presentation is going to be Many Objects, One Platform, Renegotiating Semantics Across Knowledge Graphs. And I'm going to read uh, the short bios of the three presenters, basically, basically Jessica Davis, Karen Huang, and Eva Kaplan. Uh, Jessica Davis is a research fellow at Semantic Lab Pratt and project manager um, on an NEH-funded project, which is titled Dancing Digital No Boundaries Archive Project. And it's located at the University of Alabama and University of Texas at Austin. Her interests are experiential data, multisensory knowledge making, and information and semantic technology. Now, Karen Huang, um, her research uh, focuses on the application of leaked open data to promote underrepresented histories. Her previous engagements include serving as metadata librarian for New York State Service Hub to the Digital Public Library of America at Metro. Karen's linked open data case study Mining and Mending the Gaps was featured in Northeastern University's Design for Diversity Toolkit, with more recent work appearing in a chapter of the Routledge Companion to Jazz and Gender, co-authored with Christina Patuelli, founder of Semantic Lab. And Ava Kaplan is the Research and Instruction Librarian at Teachers College, Columbia University, and Research Fellow at Semantic Lab at Pratt. Her research interests involve critical information literacy, digital humanities, and the application of ethnography to understand library systems and spaces. And I think we're going to hear about the different projects they do at the Semantic Lab and how they unify these projects and how they also adopt Wikibase and other approaches they follow. So Jessica, Karen, and Ava, or Ava, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, um, you can take it away. I will be the one sharing the slides. So thank you, Elias, and thank you for attending this talk. Um, okay. um, so I'm Karen Wong, and I'm joined for the session by my fellow colleagues, uh, Ava Kaplan and Jessica Davis. Actually, sorry, let me just... Uh, Jessica Davis. Today, the three of us are presenting some aspects of the work that takes place at Semantic Lab, a research group that operates out of the Pratt School of Information in New York City. We are joined also by Semantic Lab co-directors, Christina Patuelli and Matt Miller. The title of today's talk is One Platform, Many Projects, Renegotiating Semantics Across Knowledge Graphs. So in particular, we will be introducing you to our approach to creating knowledge graphs by means of extraction from primary sources and tell you about our experience transitioning to the management of data from multiple projects on one single knowledge base, in this case, Wikibase. In this first section, I will be giving a brief introduction to Semantic Lab's earliest project called Link Jazz in order to illustrate what has come to be our approach to creating graph knowledge from archival resources. I will discuss why and how we map that original set of project data for migration into Wikibase and the gains in moving the data to a knowledge base. An example will also be provided of a pain point in the migration and how Wikibase's native tools can be used to troubleshoot and remediate issues. The Semantic Lab began with the Link Jazz project in 2011. On this slide is an in a nutshell representation of our early, our early work. We work with transcripts of jazz oral histories, interviews from special collections and archives around the country to curate data from the interviews into triples. The goal was to create a novel data set representing relationships between people in the jazz community derived and aggregated from across many individual interviews. So for, the, for example, in this quote from an interview with jazz trombonist Melba Liston, at the bottom here, Liston mentions trumpeters Gerald Wilson and Dizzy Gillespie, um, as well as the jazz singer Billie Holiday. Each person Liston mentions creates, at minimum, a what we thought of as a nose of relationship between her and the person. By the end of 2014, about 52 oral histories across institutions have been processed, creating a data set of over 2,000 nodes of relationships. Relationships extracted from this early period can still be viewed as a clickable visualization on the website linkjazz.org, which is shown in the background of this slide. 
This method represented a departure from much of the cultural heritage linked open data work at the time, most of which focused on using linked open data for resource description, like in cataloging. But this early approach, creating triples from resource content, remains a core tenet of Semantic Lab. Up until early 2020, the data from the original Link Jazz project, these relationships, people, entities, and interviews, were stored in a relational database. We had a tool that processed the interview documents called the Transcript Analyzer that parsed and reconciled names, storing all this data in MySQL tables. This slide shows the relational database's schematic and how data was split between tables and how those very ta various table fields relate to the interview object itself. Not only was general information about the interview and mentioned names stored, but we also retained information on where the name occurred within the document itself. Every question and answer in the interview was assigned an ID for this purpose. So we stored all this project data, some of which was used to power visualizations created by Matt Miller, but essentially the only data we published and explicitly made available to the public was outputted from the matches table. These matches became the link jazz data set of nose of triples. Periodically, we outputted the matches um, from the MySQL database and artificially generated the nose of triples, then published it to our website for download as an N triples file. Over the years, there were several attempts to move the link jazz data into a triple store, but no solution stuck. As time passed, Semantic Lab added new linked open data projects like musician lists from the local 496 in New Orleans and the diaries of art historian Mary Berenson, which our colleague Alex Provo spoke about earlier in this conference. But only the link jazz data was being stored in our MySQL database, and we continued to look for a good platform to manage data for all our projects. I'm sure many listening to this talk are familiar with or using Wikidata in your own work. This session does not cover Wikidata, but what you need to know about Wikidata at minimum for this talk is that Wikidata is an open knowledge base for structured data, and that Wikibase is the software suite that Wikidata runs on. Wikibase allows you to manage data in a knowledge base as graph data. In 2019, Semantic Lab began looking at Wikibase for the management of its legacy linked jazz project data and data from newer projects. Some reasons Wikibase seemed promising to us were, one, most Semantic Lab members come into the group with a basic level of experience with Wikidata. So they would already have a degree of familiarity interfacing with Wikibase. Two, the data from many projects could share a single Wikibase. Three, Wikibase comes with some, for brevity's sake, I'll call them built-in tools for working with triples and knowledge graphs like Sparkle and batch triple crea creation with quick statements. I'll go more into Sparkle and quick statements later. Once the Wikibase was set up, the legacy link jazz data needed to be migrated. This slide shows how the legacy MySQL data relates to the data reshaped for our Wikibase as triples, referred to as statements on Wikibase. On the left side is the MySQL data organized in tables and the field names with sample values, and on the right, how the legacy data was crosswalked into triple statements on Wikibase. As you can see, transforming the legacy data into statements did not always have a straightforward correlation between the MySQL and Wikibase sides. And there is a lot of data stored on the MySQL side that was simply stored as strings, data outside the relationship triples we published. Whereas on the Wikibase side, almost all values themselves exist as entities on our Wikibase with URIs for their records. These URIs are needed to form valid linked open data triple statements. And in this slide, you see the previous mapping again but I've highlighted values both on the MySQL side and on the Wikibase side to compare what data is actually exposed to the public, what, what can be considered published. As you see on the left, most of the linked jazz data was not published originally, even though it was captured. But now here on the right, you can see that almost everything is exposed on our Wikibase. The three records shown here are from our Wikibase at Semantic Lab, and they represent the three classes of records mapped into statements from the legacy Link Chaz project, person records, interview transcript records, and block records. 
A block is how we call any question block or any answer block from an interview. As you can see, we are now providing access to a far greater amount of the project data than we had in the simple outputted downloadable and triples file. And since it is modeled as graph data, the system also enables users to query across our data for result sets using something called Sparkle, which I'm going to talk about next. Many of you may already have used a Sparkle endpoint either directly through an interface like the one pictured here or indirectly by incorporating it into your code. But I just wanted to show how migrating and remodeling data into a knowledge base like Wikibase um, with a Sparkle endpoint allows end users much more granular access to the data. This is a snapshot of the Sparkle interface that is part of the Wikibase install. You need to refer to the things by their IDs on our Wikibase, QIDs for things, um, for things and PIDs for prepositions or properties as they are called on the Wikibase. You also need to have knowledge about how the data is modeled. The goal of this query is to retrieve all the blocks of the Roy Haynes interview and to show the speaker. And I am going to go to the query now. So here's the query um, in full, and I just wanted to run the query so that people can see what the result looks like. Um, so oh. in this ex in this example, um, I'm asking for any interview that Roy Haynes as the interviewee uh, that has Ray Roy Haynes as the interviewee and the blocks that have that interview as its parent document. So let me go back up here. Um, uh, and then information about the blocks. And finally, I'm asking it to return my resor results sorting by block ID, which will give me a representation of the interview in the right order. So you can see it returns a nice table um, and you can click on to see the individual blocks and see the record of the speaker. I can drill into the data, like say that I only want blocks that are Q blocks, question blocks, et cetera. In this way, we are offering researchers and others interested in our data much more access and control over how they can see the data. If anyone wants to try this, um, I added the, this query plus some others to the slide. You can try changing the interviewee's name to get another interview. The last query um, in the little pink box will show you all the primary interviewees covered by the Link Jazz project that you can plug in instead of Roy Haynes. So the mapping of MySQL to Wikibase a few slides ago may seem like a streamlined process in outputting, transforming, and ingesting the data. But this new, much higher level of access to the data means that post-migration, we need to look at some of the data more closely. On this slide, I am showing you above to the right an example that is a snippet from Block 21 from the Roy Haynes Smithsonian interview. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that it is what we refer to as a Q block, a question, so a block from the interviewer's side. As you can see from this record, the migration of the data into Wikibase resulted in the issue of two people, Ken Kimmery and Anthony Brown, being assigned as the speaker and block for this one block. Yes, they were both on the interviewer side of this particular interview, but in oral history's assignment of any answer or question should not be to two people. Previously in MySQL, the interviewer's name was almost always stored in the transcripts table, but was not always stored in the other content specific tables, but rather just assigned a queue since the interviewer's relationships were not the goal of the project. In the case of the Roy Haynes interview, the absence of the interviewer's names, the interviewer names assigned to specific blocks resulted in the need to pull the interviewer's name from the transcripts table as the data was migrated, which in other cases worked. But in this case, there were two names. Since Sparkle querying can target the data very granularly, we needed to fine tune the data. What if people wanted to retrieve a list of all Ken Kimmery's uh, questions, especially since he was present in many of our NEA Jazz Masters interviews as the sound engineer? If we had left the data as is, Anthony Brown's questions from the Roy Haynes interview would be mixed in with Ken Kimmery's results and vice versa. So on this slide, you see how we use Wikibase's Sparkle query tool to help us remediate the migrated data. A query for all Q blocks from Roy Haynes interview returned all the blocks in duplicate due to this problem with speaker assignment. The Brown passages versus the Kimmery passages could be checked in the original transcript document against the passages in the Sparkle results. 
Once the QIDs for blocks to repair were retrieved and grouped by correct speaker, another wiki-based tool called Quick Statements was used to batch edit, in this case, remove statements as shown on the left. Each line in the Quick Statements window says, remove from block Q whatever, speaker of block Ken Kimmery, whose ID is Q2022. And on the right now, you see an example of a corrected record. So this concludes my section. I'm going to pass it now to Ava Kaplan, who will talk about a newer project at Semantic Lab developed with Wikibase as its native storage environment, um, experiments in art and technology. Thanks, Karen. In 2019, the Semantic Lab began a collaboration with the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation Archives. The foundation generously gave us a selection of materials surrounding the organization, experiments in art and technology to encode into linked data. Some labs started the EAT Knowledge Graph project in the spirit of experimentation and curiosity, since it would be the first project starting in the Wikibase environment. How can we work differently than we had with past projects? We wanted to explore how to create quality, complex, and useful data without imposing a strict structure. In this section, I'll discuss how this project was a departure from previous SEMLAB projects, such as Link Jazz, in that our source documents were diverse in content and typology. We faced interesting challenges in description. The materials primarily were surrounding avant-garde performance art, a new domain for the Semantic Lab. Additionally, we now had the wiki base and a suite of customized tools to create and store triples directly without the need for high technical understanding of linked data architectures. This afforded us the ability to expand the scope of data significantly with a bottom-up approach. From this project, we're learning and understanding how cultivating the wiki base is a dynamic and evolving process. Next slide. EAT was founded in 1966 by engineers Billy Kluver and Fred Waldauer and artists Robert Rauschenberg and Robert Whitman. It was a not-for-profit service organization whose goal was to promote collaborations between artists, engineers, and scientists. Experiments in Art and Technology was in and of itself an experimental endeavor. It aimed to bridge the gap between art and technology. EAT facilitated projects that explored multimedia, interactive installations, and performance art, pushing the boundaries of traditional art forms. Our first bunch of documents from the RRFA represented a new area for SEMLAB. The documents contained sketches, correspondence, performance ephemera, planning documents, organizational documents, event programs, and more. Unlike Link Jazz, in which the oral histories provided a standardized format for encoding, EAT documents required a more flexible and liberal approach determined by the document and not an imposed schema. As a group of LIS graduate students, we approached the documents without assumption or any predetermined interpretation. We looked at the documents to understand what the salient information was, what was unexpected, what was exciting to us, and decided to center that in our encoding process when building triples. We soon realized the rich universe of knowledge to be expanded in the Wikibase. Next slide. So a lot of the materials described complex performance art uh, pieces utilizing improvisation, audience interaction, computer programming, electronics, radios, as well as new materials at the time like plastic and styrofoam and lucite. Some performances were performed multiple times in various locations, and many included choreography, live music, sculptures, sponsors, and so on. Multiple people from various fields contributed to these innovative works. So responding to a test bed of 11 documents, folks decided to center the encoding on performance data marking another departure from linked jazz, which focused on people-to-people -people relationships mentioned in the oral histories. We would now center relationships around performance and describe people's interactions through the projects and pieces they all contributed to. Next slide. Encoding performance, we know, uh, is very complicated. 
EAT performance art is no exception, transcending conventional boundaries. People in EAT were actively trying to subvert assumptions and classifications, experimenting with how objects can have new meanings and uses, and changing the contexts and expectations of performance. The Wikibase allowed for us to represent the unconventionality of performance art freely and specifically for our data. We didn't have to constrain our data to a predefined ontology and instead expressed the highly specific nature of these documents. To ensure semantic structure and consistency with every entity we created, we had to include the P1 instance of statement containing a value that is a class. We wanted to be faithful to the ephemeral and contextual nature of performance art. So we modeled performance to illustrate its instances of creative works and events, identifying the geographic and temporal contexts and contributors for each one. Next slide, please. EAT's workflow had a different method from the past as well. To identify entities and build triples from the documents, we used a new tool developed by Matt Miller called CELA-V. This fun tool allowed us to take an OCR document and select the relationships within it. CELA-V used entity recognition for existing entities found in the document. These entities populated the palette on the right-hand side of the interface. We then created new entities as we needed, which would then pop up in the palette, and then we'd apply them to the triples. We had the opportunity to more liberally represent new domains of, domains of knowledge recorded in these documents, again, very much from the ground up. Next slide. Not only did our data grow to incorporate new domains such as events and creative works, it also expanded to illustrate the various inventions, technologies, and things that were so central to these performances. This effort was initiated in response to a specific document called The Story of EAT by Billy Kluver. It described the technological aspects of EAT performances in much detail. Here we see a quote from the story of EAT where the performance Bandonian is being described as using circuits. On the bottom right, we see a punch card with an EAT engineer whose field of work is in circuits. Once we began creating entities for these technologies, we were able to link documents and artworks and events through them. We were creating new classes for these new entities, again represented in that P1 instance of statement as we went. Next slide. A guiding principle for the SEM lab is to align semantics across projects whenever possible. However, the classes that had existed in the wiki base for the Link Jazz project weren't sufficient for describing the data from EAT materials. Linked Jazz classes reflected the project structure as a social network based on oral history documents. EAT data expanded the graph. Our process in the wiki base gave us the freedom to create classes as we needed them and revise them collectively. Next slide. As documents proliferated, so did entities and by extension classes. This rich expansion of entities was enabled by wiki base's schema free environment. We were able to choose the level of granularity we wanted to describe events, objects, and artworks and be faithful to the description of avant-garde performance art. Again, always with the possibility of adjusting them when the need arose as new projects and content is always being added. Next slide. The EAT Knowledge Graph is a truly experimental endeavor to see how to approach the freedom to build semantics in a sustainable and useful way. We were able to represent so much more data from so many new domains without squeezing things into semantic boxes. As we finished encoding documents for the knowledge graph, we were eager to understand how all this new data without a necessarily clear structure changed the landscape of the wiki base. And with that, I'll pass it on to Jessica. Thanks, Eva. And with that flexibility and experimentation, the data landscape of our wiki base grew diverse and multidimensional. Even beyond the already multidisciplinary EAT project, our knowledge graph now also included projects 
you know, before what Karen mentioned relating to jazz, also underrepresented jazz and curatorial histories, and even some that we're working on presently for historical diaries. As Ava mentioned, the structure of our wiki base was filled with projects, each traveling on their own trajectory, thoughtfully developed based on their own unique needs. But we were curious to zoom out and really understand our wiki base from a longer lens. How was this data in our knowledge graph working together? Next slide. A subgroup of semantic lab members then undertook a collaborative effort to answer this very question. To understand our current structure, we held regular brainstorming sessions supported by collective and systematic sparkle querying of our wiki base, where the results were translated into visual diagrams via Miro, which is a whiteboard, and Google Docs slides and draw. We made an inventory of the current classes and analyzed how they connected to each other or in some cases didn't connect to each other. We identified areas of conceptual overlap with the projects, but found inconsistencies in how the classes were being utilized, connected, or shared between projects. And this kind of gives you a little bit of uh, stats as of 9-26-2022. We had identified classes that have subclasses below them and not above them. We've also identified at this point number of classes that are themselves uh, that are subclasses of something else, and also a fair amount of loan classes that are not connected. At this point, if we did find uh, egregious outliers, we did make some immediate changes and updates to our wiki base. But at, we kind of at that point also identified uh, enough data to really begin to work and revise the class structure. Next slide. We looked at the cl that class inventory to identify what potential structures could emerge from the data. We saw classes that were related to each other conceptually, but were perhaps unconnected. Our assessment surfaced about five initial general classes that could serve as a temporary main branch that our inventory or classes could roll up into. An example of one such branch uh, is event under which other classes such as concert, performance and art exhibition could be nested. At the time of the inventory, I like to mention, our exhibition was not connected under event, it was a loan class. And really in practice, we have always embraced flexibility in our modeling approach, as Eva kind of had uh, alluded to, by experimenting with the ability to maintain separate but considerate approaches to our project's development, but while also simultaneously prioritizing the usability of existing elements in our wiki base. So in working through this class restructuring process, we are intentional to listen to our existing data to guide the framework build, as opposed to trying to you know, shove it into one singular schema. Next slide. By cross-analyzing the in initially modeled project-specific structures within our own wiki base, we found potential areas for consideration. And really kind of turning again to that, uh, the classes I mentioned before under event, you know, concert, performance, art exhibition, we noticed the EAT project had elements of all of those classes and some other two, uh, two other projects uh, in the area of underrepresented jazz histories, uh, the International Sweethearts and Rhythm Project and also Women of Jazz. They both had uh, concerts, uh, concert. And then also the Asian American Arts uh, Center exhibition history had um, evidence of art exhibition and performance. As best practice, we cross-reference ontologies, schemas, and vocabularies in similar areas in the field to use as reference and mapping tools, such as schema.org, OWL, linked our artsdata.ca, and Getty's AAT. We also uh, relied um, and looked to Wikidata, especially the Joan Jonas knowledge base uh, with respect to their, their modeling of performance. We never made decisions in a vacuum, and we're always in constant conversation with other efforts that are kind of happening around us. And, but really, we always return about uh, to think about what are the questions that could be asked of and answered through our wiki base. Next slide, please. As we embarked on the class modeling effort, we negotiated and then established a set of values and principles really to guide our approach. We gave consideration to it and aligned on the level of specificity, uh, the reusability, interoperability, consistency, and connectivity, also the discoverability across projects, but also just within one project, all with the ability to use Sparkle querying. We considered the trade-offs or the risks with any decisions that we made. Uh, we also kind of made affordances for outliers. They're okay, we kind of we'll deal with them. Um, but then also really the main kind of ethos behind it is to balance 
current and also future modeling needs. Next slide. And if you could just click once uh, here, it'll start in some animation. Since many of the projects had temporal components, we first set our focus to the event main branch. We iterated through multiple times to finally land on a branch structure we would implement in our wiki base. And this kind of shows all the different <laughs> iterations that we went through. And you know, through this same kind of uh, process, we've also started uh, working on other branches. Uh, next slide, please. We are still in process, as I mentioned before, with harmonizing the data to really fully realize this crossover potential that is discovered through systematic querying or really other human or machine interventions. We, and we are by no, by no means done. Uh, this is an ongoing process, but we've really prioritized our workflows according to the expansion of the domains and needs of our projects. Yet, we learned how to make compromises with each other, with our projects, with our wiki base. Throughout this pr process, we have deep, deep dived into our own existing uh, documentation and generated really even more. And this is re we've really found this to be a grounding point for us, enabling future knowledge transfer with other semantic lab members, but really others who are just engaging with our wiki base. And at, at the back of our minds, we all know that this can always change. We maintain an open stance of what projects are ingested into our wiki base, inviting curiosity when it comes to visiting new material and also revisiting in the case of what Karen mentioned before. The plasticity of the system and really our mindset allows us to keep working during the expansion of our wiki base. And if needs arise, we have the ability to make changes without feeling that penalty. All set, next slide. Thanks. And that concludes our session. <laughs> I'd love to hear any questions or thoughts um, from folks in the chat. Thank you, guys. So yeah, any questions, please post them on the chat, raise hand, type them on Slack, anything. And I'll just say too, Sarah Adams uh, thankfully had posted some of our Spock row queries. She is also a member of the Semantic Lab. So thanks, thanks for your support, Sarah. <laughs> and shout out to you. So Jessica, maybe you mentioned it. Um, how many projects are you working on right now? So link data projects that you're trying to merge together somehow in the in this graph. Gosh, that's a good question. Because we're all kind of, you know, each each one of us have had some kind of um, locking towards one particular effort. So I've primarily been working with the EAT uh, Knowledge Graph project. Um, and yeah, that's really, and then kind of transitioning to more of this like longer lens of like the wiki base effort and kind of harmonizing our, our class structure there. But oh gosh, I'm trying to think of like an exact number maybe <laughs> my other colleagues might know better. How how many people many people are you in general in in the semantic lab? Seven, I want to say <laughs> it fluctuates too because a lot of our folks um, that are coming in are are graduate uh, students, so a lot of times they are are on board as GAs and are able to help with some workflows and kind of like learn a bit more about linked open data. Um, so we've had kind of like a revolving door in some of that in some of that cases where folks are kind of on, coming on board and helping helping us out. Um, but it's been like a a wide portfolio of people over the years. I would say like about I guess seven now, or maybe less than that. Uh, probably we have anywhere between five and sometimes as many as probably nine or ten. Yeah, that's probably sure. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Oh, we have a, a question here. What percentage of your classes were you able to map to external ontologies? Well, we haven't finished yet. So, <laughs> um, but kind of like we mentioned, we were using um, 
we were guided by uh, existing ontologies uh, and other kind of authorities. Um, so it was kind of like a like a menu, if you will, of us being able to kind of identify work that's already been done that kind of aligns with what we've done. But if it doesn't exist, then we're kind of you know open to looking at other other ways that we can honor what's being represented in our in our material. But I don't yeah. know if other my colleagues, yeah, go ahead, Ava. Yeah, and I'll say um, for EAT knowledge graph, we relied a lot on controlled vocabularies, especially the Getty AAT, um, especially for organizing all of the entities around art materials and technologies. Um, so we, I don't have a validated percentage, but we used Getty a lot. And we always in the record on Wikibase, uh, you know, create a relationship to the to the Getty um, identifier. And also map a lot of a lot of mapping to uh, Wikidata too. I guess I have to read also loud. I'm, I guess you saw the comments, how thankful people are. Um, so in the MLA conference in the Music Library Association, I guess. The Link Jazz presentation was the start of Bonnie's interest in Link Data. And Frederic also said how he appreciates the thought that you have put on iterating your class relationships. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I think like a lot of like the big takeaways is that, you know. As information professionals, things like we we love a structure and we love things to be organized and then we love things to be consistent. But sometimes there needs to be that like flexibility to especially and experimentation because really a lot of this is kind of like uh, uncharted territory. Um, so if, if we're able to come up with a model that best you know honors what we're what we're trying to surface in our materials, but also having it be accessible. Um, you know, through Sparkle querying or in more systematic ways, or more computational ways, you know, it's kind of like the best of both worlds. And also just things change as we know over time. And so just already knowing that that's going to be an inevitability has been really helpful and like allowed us to kind of like let go and kind of really explore what's the most, you know, valued potential to, to reach with what our work is. There's one more question from Frederic. If you have intents to declare new classes in Wikidata or propose new classes for AAT. We do not have those intents at, at the moment. Um, there's been a few cases where we've thought about creating an entity in Wikidata so that we could store its mapping on the Wikidata record, and then we could just link to the Wikidata record for someone to sort of discover all the um, mapping to other vocabularies. But we have not considered proposing new classes for AAT. But Federique, if you have, um, if you have done that, I would love to hear more about about what that process is. Actually, we did uh, uh, submit one new class proposal to the AAT. And when I say we, I'm referring to the Wikidata, uh, the, the Wiki Project Performing Arts. So we were finding a lot of um, data sets in which performing arts were described not as performing arts venues, were not described not as buildings as a whole, but rather as the room, the hall within the building. And there was no concept matching this particular concept in uh, in the, the AAT. So the first thing that we did was to declare the class in, in ours data and give it a clear logic definition that excluded buildings. And then we said, we reached out to the AAT and we said, well, you're missing out that concept. We would need it. And we think that it would fit there within your class hierarchy. They created it, but then they decided to change the definition to something that would be either a building or a room within, within a building, which is precisely what we're trying to avoid. <laughs> so not entirely successful, 
but uh, they they at least established some correspondence. And in the meantime, we're monitoring closely how this the class in Wikidata is used so that the data is consist consistently modeled and we can query it and reuse it outside of Wikidata. That's interesting. So they didn't actually create a new class in AT, but they, oh, they, 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 they did. They did accept okay. that they, they did not declare the concept that we're mm -hmm. expecting them to declare they broadened the, the definition of it mm -hmm. that's really interesting and slightly frustrating i can imagine <laughs> what are you gonna do <laughs> And as Laura says, the spirit of creativity is impressive. So good on you. I think one special thing about the SEM lab is that it's in terms of the people a part of it, it's a mix of people who are metadata experts and linked data people, as well as novice grad students who are just sort of interested in the idea and not really sure what it is yet. Um, and that that mix is really nice. It provides us to have uh, like sort of fresh takes on how we should go about um, with our process. And then we also have people with a lot of experience who can sort of catch us if if we're going too far. Um, yeah. Okay, Frederick provides a link. The performance hall. I have a question. Um, I just uh, saw that you mentioned the linked art model, and I'm just curious how much use of it you have made, because uh, in my eyes, it seems quite complex, to be honest. Uh, I just want to ask my, yeah, I'm just curious to hear what has been your experience with it. It was definitely an area where we looked at initially, because I think a lot of the time, you know, when we embarked on the process, we wanted to kind of, especially, you know, uh, authorities, ontologies, schemas that are dealing with R, we wanted to be able to reference and see what, you know, what they were producing. But so yeah, there was a bit of like rigidity that didn't quite allow us to do what we needed to do or wanted to do, um, or felt we felt limited by it. Uh, so I think, there's some like guiding thoughts there, but it's not something that we've like adopted, you know, or mapped like specifically like a one-to-one -one, um, in a one-to-one -one way. So it was kind of a inspiration in a sense, guidance. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And like, I think a lot of some of that will come up because uh, we haven't, you know, we're still in process. So we mainly did event branch, but especially when we're getting into like some of the stuff um, that Ava was talking about with, with materiality and like technology and kind of like that, you know, slippery slope. Like it was interesting to kind of look at what they were doing. Um, but yeah, that's something that it's like, it's like one of those ones where like, well, that's going to kind of be a hard thing to work through, but So it's 10.30, but if there's a last question, we could take it. Our, our slides are uploaded to the sketch, so feel free to reach out. There's a contact slide there on the end. And, you know, if there's anything that's inspire, like inspiring you or a potential area of collaboration, you know, we'll definitely are always welcome to kind of hearing that you know, feedback and also making new connections. Great. Okay, then thanks a lot, Jessica, Karen, and Ava. I guess now we have a break of 15 minutes, our first break for today. But stay tuned because in 15 minutes we have our workshop on uh, description logic by Alex Berry. So I guess we're gonna meet again in 15 minutes. Of course, the Zoom is going to be on. So see you in quarter to um, 11. <laughs>